Welcome YouTubers. This is uh, Sports Gambling, my master series, uh, sponsored today by www.greatbeanpicks.com, which is a handicapping service I run. So let's talk about some topics today. Uh, this is kind of a compilation of topics that I put out on YouTube before, um, but I'm going to go through them in kind of an organized manner here and just put my personal thoughts on the way I feel about sports gambling and and how you can make some money uh, doing it and how it compares to other stuff in your life. So I'll have a little gambling overview, gambling addiction, sports gambling, where to bet, legality, who wins, who loses, payouts, uh, standard bets, making a living, paying for picks, free contests, and I'll close it. So let's get into it. No fun reading an overview. So gambling basically is making a wager on the outcome of an event or a series of events, hoping for a positive return. Uh, normally you don't think of what I call commodity um, or investments as gambling. Uh, you have an expectation to make money in those, and some of those would be like stock market, so investing in a company or tracking a company. Uh, gold purchase, silver purchase, rare materials purchases, you're purchasing that hoping that it will what go up in value. Uh, become rarer or whatever 401k is something that you probably if you work for somebody they you know you share that investment there or back in the old days you had a pension some people still have pensions um and so those those are gambles and real estate is something that an average person will obtain in their lifetime and you're kind of expecting that uh that will uh you know appreciate uh, not necessarily earn your money. It's a place to live, but uh, if you have an investment in real estate for renting, that's a different story. So that's that's something you can take a look at. So um, now the the key is in in all those things I listed there. There are certainly people who have lost money um, in the stock market and gold. <laughs> Pensions have been decimated. Four hundred one k's like Enron have gone away, and people have certainly lost money in the real estate matter of fact a lot of people have ton of, lost a ton of money in the real estate in the late 2000s and, and many times in the world so um yeah there's there's some risk right and when you use risk you're kind of betting uh, but those are generally sound investments that people like to in the system like to like to call it so then there's some non-commodity or really no expectation to make money or people typically lose money or more people lose money than win money and sports, betting on sports events kind of falls into that category. The lottery definitely falls in that category. Think about the people who have played the lottery and the people who have won. It's a very low number compared to, I don't know, 210 million Americans that have played the lottery at some point. Raffles, small raffles, big raffles uh, usually have a few winners. Poker hands in tournaments usually have you know one winner or a small amount of uh, winners that get make money or you know get paid in a certain tourney. Uh, in casino games, you kind of got no expectation to make money long term, but you might sit down for a short stint and make some money, but uh, rarely do you make money long term in those casino games, so no expectation to make money, but that's definitely gambling. Definitely casino games are gambling, poker is gambling, sports events are gambling, lottery is apparently not gambling, but probably has the worst outcome of all, unless you're a winner. Uh, raffle is not usually thought of as gambling, but uh, it would fall in there. So those those are the overviews of gambling. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that type of stuff later in the topics. Uh, first of all, I should always speak about gambling addiction. And, you know, you can always visit Gamblers Anonymous online. And they'll, there's a 20-question survey, and you're probably not addicted, right? Um, very small portion of the population are addicted. And I guess addicts uncontrollably lose significant portion of their money. And... You know, it's just sort of like being mentally ill, in my opinion. You know, there's people have a couple screws loose to start with to be a gambling addict. You're probably addicted to a bunch of other stuff or you have, what, an addictive personality or something. But you often would or does lose their money in a different manner. So they'll smoke. They'll, you know, do whatever. You know, they'll play the lotto, <laughs> you know, scratch-offs. Uh, spend all their money on that if they wasn't, if they wasn't gambling on, on uh, sports events. And uh, overall, you know, for that, I, I know there's bad that we have mentally ill and they'll, they'll do it. But, you know, they're, they're the ones that help contribute as long as all and all losers uh, help contribute to the winners. So uh, thanks for contributing. That's kind of my overfeel about it. It's a tough world, uh, tough life. Um, 
just uh, sorry if you're in that boat. So let's talk about sports gambling. Um, and so you're wagering on a sport event. Typically people do this because it adds some viewer entertainment. You know, if you're watching a game and you have some money on it, you do get a kind of a rush out of it or you kind of got some hope there. You know, if you're watching, I don't know, if your team, your baseball team is in fourth place in their division and it's late in the season, there's not a lot to play for. <laughs> you kind of kind of a boring game to watch or whatever it is. But if you've got some money on the line, um, certainly adds an aspect and would maybe watch a game that you wouldn't normally or follow it a little closer. Um, big bets are types of bets are the money line. That's you're going to bet. You just pick who's going to win and the payouts adjusted according to the rate odds factor, whatever you want to do it, favorite, not favorite. So they'll adjust the payout according to, to make it a more fair game. Otherwise you would, if it was even, even you'd always pick the, the favorite, right? So, but that favors, money line favors people who can pick winners overall, just straight up winners, overall winners at a very high rate. Um, so if you're able to do that, that's, that's a good time to play that. Um, yeah, spread betting is where you've got a handicap winner. So uh, somebody might be, you know, Patriots might be favored by 10 points. Well, that means you're going to have to subtract 10 points that are final score. And that's what I mean by score adjusted. And then you see if so the Patriots win by more than 10, then you win. If they win by less than 10, then you don't win. Or if the other team wins, right? So um, that's if, if you see value in those lines, then that's the type of bet that you should do there if you're good at doing that. Uh, totals over under is the combined scores. And again, you, it's about seeing value in the totals. So if people put a low total out there and you think it's going to be a high scoring game because you just feel it, then um, yeah. So if you're good at that, that's a, that's what you should bet there. It's sort of a different type of bet. The first two bets are, are picking winners based upon all facets of the game. Uh, totals is just certain facets of the game. I mean, it is play in there, but... Um, and then there's props. So, you know... <laughs> And it could be money line spread and totals for the first half or the second half. Could be who's going to win the coin toss, who's going to score first, uh, who's going to get the first penalty, number of turnovers in a game. There's all kinds of stuff that that uh, uh, props bets um, that are out there. And if you're probably doing a lot of props bets, then you're probably a sports addict. But there's money to be made in uh, in, in everything. So um, where can you bet? Uh, well, it depends upon where you live. You know, if you don't live in the America, there might be a local casino. If you live in America, there might be a local casino too. Um, if there's a local casino, it's probably legal to bet there if they have a sports book. Online is a place to do it. Um, bookies, friends, co-workers, even illegal places. Sometimes bookies are illegal places. But, you know, that's that's where you can go bet. Those are places that are available to bet to most Americans and most foreign people. Um, legality is also depends upon where you live. Um, most places in America, it's typically illegal, um, but it's tolerated. So let's talk about who wins and who loses. Um, obviously the winning better, um, it typically uh, receives 91% of the pro proceeds. Um, that's a standard bet. We'll talk about standard bets in a little bit, but that's who wins most of the money. Of course, gambling winnings overall are taxed as uh, personal income, so taxpayers win. Um, sports books collect the other 9% of the proceeds, and so they usually hire employees, they have stockholders, they have suppliers, and they pay taxes too. So taxpayers win again, and the people who lose are the pe losing better, and they get 0% of the proceeds, but keep in mind that they you know, voluntarily fund the market. Um, most people volunteer. They're not forced to make sports bets. They make it on their own accord, hoping to be a winner. Um, and that's usually who wins and who loses in a nutshell. Payouts is what the sports book will um, pay out if you win. And so a standard bet is called minus 110 odds or just a standard bet. And what that means is that you'll win slightly less in profit than you bet. So if you bet $10, you would win $9.09 .09 if you won, 
basically you hand them ten dollars and they hand you back nineteen dollars and nine cents but your profit is nine dollars and nine cents since you're winning less than you're putting up you need a higher than 50 50 ratio win rate and so this is where you get that magic 52.4 percent win rate required to break even so you need to do better than that um, in your picks but that's kind of an illusion because in the table below I've got a whole bunch of variable payouts and I've highlighted an orange in the middle um, the minus 110 and that's where the 909 in profit and the 52.4 but as it gets worse minus 120 minus 130 minus 140 minus 150 um, you make less profit per the each ten dollars you bet so at minus 150 you're getting six dollars and sixty seven cents or two-thirds of it and you need a sixty percent win rate to break even of course the casino is pocketing three dollars and thirty three cents there so they're making more profit as that um, payout goes down and at minus two hundred you're getting five dollars back so you need to win two-thirds right so if you won twice you'd profit ten dollars and if you lose once you'd lose that ten dollars so that's why you need to win two-thirds of your games and you'll see the payout uh, a lot in money lines for sure um, but even in standard betting you know like just uh, spread betting or money or um, totals and props you'll you'll get some little bit of variation off that minus 110 now what's interesting on the right hand side of that orange minus 110 there's a plus 100 which is even so basically they're going to take the ten dollars and give you back ten dollars in profit and so it's kind of an even the casino makes nothing there and it's a 50 50 win rate on that if you get into the positives beyond that which is kind of strange so plus 110 plus 120 plus 130 plus 140 plus 150 plus so plus 150 you're getting uh, 15 dollars back so you're actually getting more money back than were put in um, even by an opponent right so so you, they need a lot more losers um, than winners so you, you're kind of betting underdogs here when you get these these high payouts but yeah if you put ten dollars in you would get fifteen dollars in profit and so you only need to win forty percent of the time at plus 150 and if you got to plus 200 um, you know it's um, twenty dollars in profit you only need to we need to win one third so that's why because you've got a mixture of payouts you'll bet in your lifetime that win rate doesn't always make a whole lot of sense um, to you it's got to be a blended number and there are there are payouts that are below minus 200 and above positive 200 or plus 200 um, but you know so you can if you only bet you know plus 200 you'd only need to win a third of the time you win a third of the time and make money or at least break even so that's why those win rates don't really make a whole lot of sense um, as far as a percentage but you always see percentages quoted so I just kind of flush them aside so we already talked a lot about standard bets and props I'm just gonna go back into it and say that standard bets are your frequent ones and your influential you're always gonna see a money line and spread um, and, and again they concern basically all aspects of the game and what the outcome will be basically one team against the other and you're kinda figuring out which team you think is better um, another one at standard again was the totals or the over under um, but I treat that like a prop and when I when I and when I talk about props I'm talking about stuff that's kinda got an infrequent occurrence so you know the flipping of a or seemingly non-influential so if you bet the coin toss at the beginning I mean I guess you could do some stats and figure out if this particular ref flips the coin a certain heads a lot more than the other little inside info or something there that you'd studied skillfully um, but in general it's kinda you're kinda non-influential on that you're just kinda trying to get lucky there and I, I even totals I kinda see that it's not all aspects of the game because you know, you're know taking in the weather and other stuff like that and whether the team will run the ball a lot in football that would affect your totals right versus uh, passing a lot and you could have a passing team that decided to run today and they're going to go under because they you know they're chewing a lot of clock so it's, it's kind of kind of proppy that way and i don't see a lot of people do really well long term on prop bets um of course i don't have all the data in the world maybe someone does very excellent in prop bets but uh for the most part i'm going to stick with just money line and against the spread as being uh, the most reputable ones uh, to look at and they're easiest to get info on and they're easiest to see people's results and like contests and stuff like that uh, making a living so I've got some estimates in here um, again it's a losing proposition overall 
but short-term success rate, so I'll call it like a sporting season, so a particular NFL, a particular NBA, a particular MLB season, what I see is approximately two-thirds of contestants will lose money, and of course they fund the winning one-third and whatever the sports books take. So roughly a third of the people will win money in a given season. I've tracked enough seasons sort of on these free contests and, and various others that I'll probably believe that. But long term, you know, season after season after season, it's a lot more difficult to obtain money, uh, to obtain winning, you know, success. Um, and I put 90% out there or more will probably lose money. Um, I found numbers to even be like 80% will probably lose money. But, you know, 10 to 15 percent above that aren't going to make a whole lot of money uh, they'll probably quit you know in these contests or something so i don't know what that rate exactly is because it's, it's hard to judge people over time but probably one percent will make a significant amount of money and 19 percent will make a little bit of money and you know 80 percent will lose money or something you know I, it's, it's you have to do a little bit of research and it's just hard to find out but i'm guesstimating that ballpark that um you know a significant amount of people will lose money and a very low number will be very very success, successful uh, long term but one way or another when you're doing these sports betting um skilled or talented betters um need to be x percent better than the other contestants they're playing against um, since it's funded by the community and so when when you think about contests if you're better than the people you're playing whether it's in your office pool or whatever um, then that's the that's the people you need to play against um, it's not the NFL where you know there are TV and people are selling tickets so you know they're gonna be funded in other manners I mean if you're on TV and your sports leagues on TV you're that you are your betting league right then then you probably could make some money selling ads and stuff like that but it's similar to other self-funded or low funding contests so poker is one of those things where usually you know 50 people show up at your local little poker hall and everybody puts in 50 bucks into the contest and then the contest organizers take about some money to pay you know the the rent and the dealers and stuff like that and uh, distribute the rest of the funds to a small number of winners like maybe the top 10 out of that 50 or top five out of that 50 will win money and the rest of the people so the majority of people go home losers uh, in that poker tournament it's the same thing in running and triathlon you know a lot of people pay for those type of things but but um not very few winners right maybe you get a t-shirt you know or something but very few winner winners if they have a many at all you know um fishing tournaments, non-professional golf, you know, scrambles and stuff like that. And even if I take it outside, you know, sports, if I say something like house flipping, um, you know, there are going to be people in your area trying to buy up distressed property at auctions, right? And if you're not as good as the next person, um, you can't do it for as cheap of a price, upgrade a flip a house to upgrade it to sell it. So you need to put, you know, $100,000 into a house. So you need to, for a $200,000 house that you want to sell, you need to put 100000 into it. That means you need to buy that house for like 75000 And if somebody else can do it for like 60000 then they can easily outbid you at that auction and pay one ten for it and still, you know, survive. Whereas so what you find is you can't buy any houses, right? Because they're just better. So that's just a different angle on the same type of thing that you're doing here and, and the, the idea is that you need to be better than the people you're playing against whether it's in a small venue or a bigger venue but sports betting is a little bit differently because it's got a very large pool typically you're talking about the world or you know even if you're at a particular house a lot of those lines and stuff are set based upon um, industry standards and large pools uh, where people get the money get the get the info from you know that f fuel these lines and fuel the, the spreads and the, the payouts so and you don't see them vary a whole lot from house to house there is some variance um, but but overall you're playing like the entire market right <laughs> and uh, you get really high distribution rates I told you you're gonna win 91% uh, when you win so um, you know that the, they're only skimming off nine percent so um good to be in sports betting because you're not going to get shrunk down like poker you know and you got everybody got equal skill in poker after a little bit of time and uh, you didn't win a lot of money 
because it was hard to get. You didn't have a lot of fish at the table, right, that you could just roll over and take their money fairly easy, whereas in sports betting, there's a lot of fish out there still, um, and they're coming all the time. Now, that could change over time. We're only smart people sports bet, but um, it's tough right now because there's just so many people doing it, right? Um, paying for picks, handicapping. I'm kind of in the business of uh, getting paid for making picks. So here's my angle on it, which is if you do this, again, I told you 90% of you will end up being long-term losers. Um, so 90% of you should probably be better off than on your own uh, paying for picks, so long as that, you know, you must select a handicapper that's capable. Um, and that's the tough part. You know, it's a little bit tough, but if they're capable and you can prove they're capable, then you're probably better off paying for picks. Um, Hammer camper must be amicable to making money in this manner. A lot of people who are probably good handicappers don't want to do this. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, the market is kind of a scammy market, and it's just a pain in the ass. And if you can just take your money, and you're happy with the money that you bet on your own, with the bet limits that the casino has provided for you, um, and you don't want to take an additional money, then they, some people just don't want to deal with it, right? Don't want to sell it. Um, I think most winners do sell it. I think that's how they become handicappers in the first place. Um, cause it's extra money. I mean, you can only bet so much, uh, um, as an individual. I mean, I can, I can go online and get multiple houses, but still you're stuck at a certain point. I mean, I can't, they're not going to take a million dollar bet for me. Um, and so they're going to take, they're going to put a limit on what I can bet. Therefore there's a limit on what I can make. So I'm looking at other ways to make money. Uh, only pay what it's worth to you. That's, you know, and, but keep an open mind on results. So you're taking all the risk. You know, if you buy picks, uh, you're forking out cash. You're probably laying down your own cash at the sports book. Uh, you're taking all the risk. If you lose, you're going to lose your money. Um, but you're getting some portion of the gain. Um, I guess you need to figure out when I talk about options, like, what else would you spend that money on? Now, if you've got an inside and you're doing venture capital or you can start a restaurant and make a ton of money, um, then so be it. You know, that's a good place if you had that much money and you're able to do that. Um, but otherwise, you know, you, you'd be in like the stock market or you'd be in, you know, IR, IR you know, uh, trusts or something or you know just uh, bonds you know four or five year bonds or whatever you've got your money and you're making or your checking account and you're making like less than one percent right or savings account um and i often see people hey they go to the restaurant this is an example that i just use all the time and does not really uh, um financial but it's like you know you go to the restaurant you drop 50 bucks on dinner and you give the the waitress and the staff a ten dollar tip right twenty percent because you felt good and uh they did a good job well okay so you gave them you give them a twenty percent tip right but i give you winning picks and you double your money in a year let's just say you do it in a year you know it's like okay i, I doubled my money this year so what, what 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 would you pay me, right? And it's like, well, one percent, right? Because you're just managing, you're just giving me the picks. I'd I'd like to pay you know two hundred dollars, right, for picks. And it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Just think about that long term. That you know, you pay these people twenty percent, and somebody who could, you had an option of getting a you know a five percent return in the stock market or in your bonds, and here you turn around and got a hundred percent. Well, probably should open up the pocketbook a bit. All right, I'm off my horse. Uh, basically, you need to measure the efficiency of the picks when you're paying for picks. So obviously, the more that people win per pick, um, the lower the bankroll you need and the more you can scale your picks proportional to your bankroll and make more money. Um, you know, people who are not very efficient, um, they could be winners still, but, you know, they consume a whole lot of money. You know, you need a much larger bankroll to win a small amount of money um, and your ROI starts to drop at that particular point. If you need to invest 50 grand in bankroll and you're going to make $10,000 a year, um, you know, you need to think about that. That's a 20% ROI. Um, but if you got a very efficient picker and you're able to, I don't know, take that same 50 grand, or let's just say you took 20 grand and you made 10 grand off of it, then you don't, you know, you can, that's a lot of money that was freed up or it gives you a lot of opportunities, or you could have bet more, you know, could have used the 50 grand and now you make 30 grand, right? So you make it three times the amount. 
So you need to look at efficiency of the picks uh, and the picker you're with. And sometimes you just need to be with them. Sometimes you can figure it out otherwise. Um, and experience counts, but doesn't count. You know, you need somebody's hot now, um, doing well now. Um, sometimes the experienced people don't. I mean, there's always something to be said for winning for 20 years, right? Or having a, just a few bad seasons for 20 years. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they might not be giving, you got to look at their efficiency combined with the experience. If you don't have much experience at all, then there's always some, some thing that you were on fluke. Like, Hey, you see this all the time. A handicapper comes out and says, Oh, I won last, you know, last NFL season I won. And then you break it down. They're like, well, I made 12 bets. Right. And you won. Well, that's not enough to give you a clue as to what their long-term success would be. 12 bets over a season just doesn't do it. And that means they're picking good spots and maybe they won like, you know, eight of those or something, you know, and, or 10 of those, right? I was 10, 10 and two this season, right? You know, on my Monday night specials or something. Um, you'll find out that, that people will come up pretty quick. They'll be hot and they'll peak and they'll just, either give up or never never win again um the, you you are what you are and you'll eventually get there and we see that and rare is the person who has tons and tons of experience you might just need to go to somebody who has less experience is hot now um not the best advice but it's the way it is otherwise you'll sit around waiting for waiting for something that ain't gonna happen so a good place to get your feet wet and to follow some people and for me as a handicapper i like to put it out here because i feel it's you know some standing of where i'm at better than some handicappers that don't give you any idea they give you some hyperbole about the you know the, they got 50 pickers on their staff and here's the two pickers who were doing well well yeah that's statistics will bear that at any particular time that you know 20 percent of your pickers are doing well <laughs> they should have five people right you know but whatever um, so wagerminds.com and covers.com hold contests. I like the wager mind ones a lot because it's more realistic uh, in the payout scale and you get familiar with how bets work and uh, where it's at. But you have fixed bets and normally it's five units on wager mind. You can't bet one, two, three, four, or five, but most of the time people just bet 90% plus of the bets are just five units. So a particular bet is five units. Um, you have an unlimited bankroll. So they don't really care about bankroll. You're not fixed in there or something like that. Um, and that's the opposite of the real world for most people. Most people have a fixed bankroll to gamble with. And you have virtually unlimited bets. You might have a $1,000 bankroll and you can make a $1,000 bet on something, on who's going to win the coin toss, right? Um, and once you get a very high bankroll, then yeah, you're kind of on fixed bets because they, like I told you, um, sports books won't always take all your money. Yeah in a bet um so that's how that works um you'll find that leaders on wager mind have like 400 units lifetime there's a couple of people who have 400 units that's like up 80 bets um most of those streaked out pretty quickly like within a you know two months to a year got those 400 units um then have been flat but you know come come back so it's always worth taking this changes over time um, often there's a lot of new contestants. They come in and they'll make 100 to 200 units in the first month or two because uh, they're betting a lot of stuff. You know, and the more, again, with fixed bets, it, it, they try to encourage you to make um, a lot of bets because there's nothing to risk. So you you see people who will bet, you know, the over, the, the you know, the over-under. They'll bet the spread. They'll bet the money line concurrently, all three on the same game. And then they'll do the first half of those, and then they'll do the second half. So they're making like nine bets, right, Again, on a particular contest. Well, if you get lucky, and it's easy to hit 60% and get lucky for, I don't know, a few months, you'll make a ton of units. Yeah, I mean, most of the time they don't get 60% on all of those, but, I mean, if you pick three of them and got 60%, you can get easily get 75 points, you know, over 100 games um, per each one of those. So you can, you can get 200 units pretty quickly, and you'll see them. But eventually, though, time catches up with them. Rarely do the you see people, you're kind of looking for people who just have a slow rise and are able to scale. But it's impressive. It's always impressive. But again, every if you just shoot out of the gun and, and you make a whole bunch of bets wildly, um, just pick them at random. Or whatever you feel uh, then you can get lucky and actually you know five percent of the people will uh, 
would make a couple hundred units um, following that. 95% people wouldn't, but 5% would, and you'll see the 5%. Sometimes those people quit. At, quit. Other times they keep playing, and you'll see that they start to regress or the second year that they play. Um, they're not in a positive. But it, it because you're risking nothing in these contests, the, um, a lot of people frequently make bets. I try to stick to like a real world, and I'm just proving out that I'm a handicapper. So I'm not going to win the contest because I don't make enough bets. There's just no way I can do that, right? Because um, it's like having, you know, if you make nine times the bets, then you have like nine times the bankroll. Um, so just not going to win. Um, and a lot of times um, the contestants, especially the ones that get 102 units in the first month or two, uh, they frequently owe you totals. I call those props, right? Again, uh, make up a large percent, a significant percent, like half of those, half of that wins, or sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's you know 80 percent of those wins were OU wins, and those almost always don't sustain that. I mean, for years you won't be a four four year winner with OU totals. It just doesn't happen. I've seen four year winners with uh, you know. Um, ATS or uh, ATS is against the spread or money line uh, where people have four successful seasons in a row where they make pretty good stash but almost never do you see the OUs um, and again so I, that's why I find it very propish I find the real world doesn't doesn't add up with those OUs so there's 14,300 users on wager mines currently a little bit a little bit more but whatever uh, 45 of those have greater than 100 units aggregate lifetime. So again, 143 would be 1%. So right, so you're one third of 1%, right? So that's the people who have amassed over 100 units and currently have over 100 units. Uh, to flip that coin, 2,273 have greater than zero units. So that's I don't know. 18% whatever I'm doing now a little bit less than 20% so that's where I was getting up with those numbers that probably realistically without you know because you can make as many um, logins as you want on this probably the same there's less betters than 14,300 I personally have two or three accounts so you just know it's less less people um, and people are the skill but that's just a good breakdown it is going to probably somewhat work out that way in the real world um, cause people will lose and they'll quit, right? And maybe they'll start another one and they'll have a streak of goodness and eventually come back, right? Um, but the purpose of this is that you can go out and determine on your own if you have the goods to win by just by signing up for this. It's free. All you need is a email, right? And a handler and you log in and you make your picks, see if you're good enough. And if you can do it, I don't know, half a year and you're doing well, uh, you won't need handicappers. Your congratulations. You're part of the, at least the 10% that can win. Uh, you may be part of the 1%, in which case you get a lifetime of uh, doing well. But if you're not in that, if you're like the 99% who probably aren't like the 1%, then um, you know hopefully I'm going to do well on those wager mines, and I'll prove to you uh, that I'm a good handicapper. But otherwise, take a look at handicappers or get out of sports betting altogether i don't not advising that because i like making money off you um but then sports gets back to being pretty boring um which it is and it's somewhat predictable and that's part of the beauty of it um so that's it if you have uh some questions after this you can reach me on this uh on this, uh, you can just post a question below, and I'll be happy to. Uh, skeptics abound, I'm sure, but uh, um, if you're looking for some investment opportunities, again, you can get in touch with me at greatdanepicks.com, and we can work something out. Um, hopefully, you win. I like winning. Um, and if not, well, thanks for listening. Um, and you can view some of the other topics on my channel, which will break down some of these. Or, you know, I've said my piece here. So, uh, thanks. Good night.